Powell? Here. Hoffman? Here. McGillray? Here. Jackson? Here. Nelson? Here. Cavell? Here. Gingell is absent with notice. Kuhn? Here. Gershenson? Here. Lubes? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, please join me in rising for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our next item is approval of the minutes from January 25th, 2022. I have a motion by Commissioner McGilvery, support from Commissioner K Nelson. Uh, any comments or questions on the minutes? Uh, uh, Commissioner McGilvery. Thank you. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The minutes are approved. The next item is approval of the agenda. I have a motion by Commissioner Commissioner Hoffman, support from Commissioner, who would like to support Commissioner Cavell. Any comments on the agenda? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The agenda is approved. Our next item is our first public comment for comments of items on the agenda. Is there anybody from the public wishing to comment? All right, public comment is closed. We move, down, we move on to communications. There are three items in communications, an update on FEMA reimbursements as of December 31st, the Firehouse Subs Public Safety Foundation to purchase equipment for the Sheriff's Search and Rescue Team, and the third item is the Hazardous Materials Emergency Preparedness Grant. Any comment? And, well, I need a motion to receive and file communications. Uh, I have a motion by Commissioner Jackson, support from Commissioner Powell. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. All right, communications is carried. We are on our regular agenda item. The first item under our regular agenda is a presentation by Beyond Basics, Literacy is for Everyone. And I would invite uh, Pamela Good uh, to come to the front of the table um, for a presentation or the side. I don't know how you want to do that. Okay, perfect. Perfect, so, welcome. Yeah, thank you. So pleased to be here. And we have to thank Janet Jackson and Tom Kuhn. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think David Woodward, I know he's not here today, but we've had some folks uh, hear this story and think that it needs to be spread. And the so mic. they've invited us mic. to attend yeah, today. Oh, to, yes, be, the because mic. we're recording. Oh. Yes, when you're talking, use a microphone. Okay, this one here? That's fine. Okay, can, should I, does it go higher? Can you hear me now? Yeah, can you see it? Can or I sit? I can, but it? I'm not going to be able to see the slide. Oh, you mm. can scroll the slide. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. got it. Thank you. <laughs> it's my first time here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I guess uh, I just give a brief history before we go into the slideshow. Um, 20 years ago, it was in 1999. I delivered coats to a school on behalf of Eastover Elementary School. Uh, in Bloomfield. We went to Herman Rogers Academy downtown, and I would say that my eyes were open to, um, you know, just a community that seemed to need everything. They didn't have all the extras that our kids that went far beyond coats that they needed. Um, they didn't have enrichment programs and, um, you know, computer class and music and all of those things. And so Beyond Basics really started as an uh, academic enrichment program uh, where we would do reading buddies, um, publishing centers, book clubs, art with the master's classes, just trying to bring some of the exciting things to the kids there. 
And um, through that process, we became aware that the kids couldn't read. It wasn't that they were just a little bit behind in grade level, but they were multiple grade levels behind. And it took four years of going deeper and deeper with an intervention until we were able to get grade level movement. And our success today is that we've worked in the lowest performing schools across uh, Detroit and Taylor. And uh, we are able to get kids on average reading at grade level in just six weeks. Um, Literacy is not a one size fits all. Uh, some kids are a little bit behind, and some of the kids, especially in high school, can be six, seven, eight grade levels behind. And so they get stuck at different points. And so uh, our first grade level movement um, through an intensive one on one curriculum was in 2008. We perfected at K 8, went into high schools in 2011, and we've been uh, just tutoring as many kids as we can, privately raising the dollars. Um, public money really hasn't been available for this until the literacy lawsuit settlement money, and then also some of this, uh, as Nolan Finley claimed, uh, COVID cash that's floating around. We've been able to get some district dollars, uh, but otherwise we've been privately funded. And so um, I see this as uh, the largest e epidemic in America, and that it will continue to take a private public partnership to fund it, because the numbers are high. So that's our background. And the slideshow um, really just kind of shows the impact of illiteracy on society, and it gives laser focus to a to the flaw so that we can come together and solve this. And I would say if this gets embraced with some zeal, that in any school district, anywhere from one to five years, you could have your kids literate and we could be, you know, this problem could be behind us in a very short period of time. So I don't know <clears throat> if there are questions before we start with the uh, slideshow. But we're interested in the information. Commissioner Kuhn brought this to our attention, and we, I think, individually have always felt that mm -hmm. tutoring is an important piece, especially in the pandemic when children uh, were removed to remote learning for mm -hmm. a period of time and <coughs> lost many skills. So mm -hmm. thank you for being here. Yes, yes. I, I would say that those kids have, <clears throat> uh, you'll see in the presentation that being a grade level behind is significant. Mm -hmm. You fall into that gap where you don't get the intervention you need. And what we've had happen right now is that we've had many kids who were not in that gap join those kids who are. And my hope is that they will shine some light on all of the kids that really need the help. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. so I look at, you know, I look at this as been a huge problem, but there are some silver linings to all that we've suffered these last few years. And if we embrace literacy because of it, that would be one of them. Thank you. Commissioner yeah. Powell? And I just want to say, uh, I want to say thank you to Sean, just to let my colleagues know, Sean has been trying to get me to come and see the center down South Oakland mm -hmm. for about a couple months now, but we've had scheduled conflicts. So yes. I want to thank my colleague, um, uh, Mr. Kuhn, I mean, Commissioner Kuhn, for bringing this before us so we can finally see this wonderful presentation. Because I know uh, in my district it's, it's duly needed. Um, so I'm hoping that I can assist in making some connections moving forward. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right, slideshow. Okay, <laughs> great. So, what did I say? Uh, now. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Um, I wonder if they can make it. Do you think they can go? Yep, of course they can go full straight screen. So I, um, you know, I've learned that this isn't just uh, Detroit's problem, Michigan's problem. This is America's problem. This is what I talk about in our state is across America. It's because we have a similar educational model everywhere. Um, so we have the problem everywhere, but we can also roll out the solution very quickly because it is that same model. Uh, so I call it the America's largest and most solvable disability. Okay, next. Um, what is the literacy gap? We're going to define that just so we have something to talk about. We say at Beyond Basics that is if a child is more than a grade level behind in K-12 education, so more than a grade level behind their academic grade, they fall into the literacy gap. Next. <clears throat> Why that's significant is um, 
Detroit we're using as an example. They have about 52,000 children. 43% of those students are in the gap. They're more than a grade level behind. And I'm here to tell you that they start out at two or three grade levels behind, and they continue to stay behind. Uh, so um, it's an epidemic, um, and in our vulnerable communities, it's worse only because there are more kids that are in that gap, but they're, they're kids in the gap in every district. Uh, next. So what uh, happens is, as society, we're funding education. We're funding a phenomenal educational model. We have a phenomenal model in America. The, the model isn't broken. We don't have to reinvent education. But there is a detrimental flaw. And that flaw is that our kids are not able to read and write the language that we're rolling out the curriculum in. You can't even measure the teachers, because the model is set up so that a teacher would take a class of third graders and prepare them for fourth grade. And what we find is they're having to do remediation. And they can't do one-on-one -on -one when 30 out of 33 kids in their class are not reading at grade level. And so there's a flaw that we can, through partners, flatten that curve, COVID <laughs> vocabulary, but really we need to flatten the curve because this problem has gone on for so long. So right now what we have is that about 15% 50, of the kids in Detroit are able to plug into life as all of us believe that everyone's able to do, to get a job, to go to college. Uh, while 85% of them are not able to read well enough to get a job, and they fall into a social service system. And uh, they become dependent one way or the other on society. We've included corrections, um, workforce development, because there is a correlation between illiteracy and the problems we have in our jails. 85% of the prisoners are illiterate. In our juvenile detention centers, the number is that high. We have an illiteracy crisis in America, and it's easily, easily solved because it's so fast. Remember, on average, six weeks, and you get someone reading. Next. So um, what we've done here is to take the lowest achieving uh, district in a, in a county and compare it to the highest achieving. And we're focusing on the literacy gap. So you can see in Detroit, we've talked about the literacy gap. The kids in that gap are 85 percent. But in Gross Point Public Schools, people find it hard to believe in Wayne County, highest achieving public school, has 28% in the gap. That's a pre-COVID number. Um, people say, well, what makes up that gap? Well, some of the parents from Detroit get their kids to Gross Point thinking they're going to get literacy. But no, nope, the flaw is in every district. They do not get the intensive literacy that they need to uh, improve. The other children that are in that gap at a higher percentage, we see more and more children with ADHD, dyslexia, autism, even English language learners who may speak the language, they cannot read and write it, and they fall into the gap, and they're not able to access the education that we're funding for them. Now, in Oakland County, uh, Pontiac is the lowest in terms of uh, they have more kids in the literacy gap. But Rochester Community Schools, this is 21% uh, is a 2019 number. Uh, we did just do a new number. There's 30% now of kids in the literacy gap in Rochester Community Schools. And I will. we've tutored some of the kids. Parents have found us over the years because the schools don't offer this intensive one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And one of the parents, uh, one of the dramatic cases that I'll talk about now. Their son went to Rochester Community Schools, was a ninth grader, autistic, and the school basically said that they really couldn't help him learn to read. And she, we crossed paths, and she said, can you help him? And I said, I don't know, bring him in. So we assessed him, and we found out he was reading at a fourth grade level. And here he's in a classroom of kids who read at a ninth grade level, so it exasperated his autism. Uh, she came out to uh, Southfield every day after school for two or three months, and um, we, f we tested him after that time, and we were able to get him reading at the ninth grade level. He's reading above a high school grade level now, and he's college-bound, so life-changing. So these are kids that were really um, 
You know, uh, it's a death sentence, really, for their lives if we don't get them literate. They're showing up to society's doors, and I think we have a moral obligation to prepare them for the very education that we're already funding. Uh, next. So what we did here is to pull a literacy gap together. And we, could, we can share this with you, because there's a lot of numbers on it. But one, I wanted you to see. We go to public scores on, um, that the ed that education um, keeps um, on levels of deficiency, tier one, two, three, four, and we're able to correlate it to a level of literacy intervention. And so that's how we end up determining how many kids are in the gap in a particular district. And you can see as a total, uh, overall, you have 41% in Oakland County. People find that shocking. Uh, you have 63,320 kids this year attending uh, public education that are more than a grade level behind. And you have, uh, in Oakland County, you have schools like Troy, and we have met with the mayor there, 24%, 3,000 students. Now, Troy is a high-achieving district, but the way you get to be a high-achieving district is you have more high-achieving students than the other districts. It doesn't mean that you don't have students that need additional help. And so it kind of uh, dilutes the, those kids. You know, They fall under the radar, the ones that need help, because they're attending a high-achieving school. Um, and so... In any district, uh, I'm just thinking, you have, I think, one of the highest is 65% of the kids. You don't have any schools. I thought there was, yes, there's an 83%. Um, and I thought Oak Park was another. Um, but anyway, I, I think that the message here is that every district needs help. Some need more than others. And the reason is that the emergency, that we have more children that desperately need help in some districts. And we need to get that help to them as soon as we can. Next slide. So this is, uh, this is just one slide to talk about our, um, our curriculum. So the flaw I've talked about is kids in the literacy gap. Um, they can't read, they're more than a grade level behind. But another flaw, and I think that this evolved uh, partially because of No Child Left Behind, but the assessments that the state are giving right now uh, cause kids to just fall in proficiency areas. They're assessed online, oftentimes in groups, and they're either put in advanced proficiency um, proficient or below proficiency. But they don't really zero in and say, why is that student behind and how far is he behind? And so what we do is to start out, we have certified teachers that work for us to administer the Woodcock <coughs> Reading Mastery Test. It's a test that enabled that Luke for us to see that that ninth grader was reading at a fourth grade level. The boy is on the right, that's Elijah. We met him at Central High School, he was a senior. He was reading at a first grade level. You need to know that he's reading at a first grade level and not just at a 10th grade level to know how to help him. So I think one of the things that educators have to change going forward is we have to start doing an intensive one-on-one -on -one assessment. I think it should be at third, sixth, ninth grades. Now. Initially, we've got to go in and assess them all and get them reading. But after we get all these kids reading, you do need to continue to assess kids to see that you don't start building up an epidemic of this in the future. So we assess kids. We partner with districts. They give us a room that we run our programs out of. We are a during the school day model. So we work alongside the, the principals and the teachers there. We set up our Beyond Basics Literacy Center. We bring the students in. We do a one-on-one -on -one assessment. And we give them a prescription for literacy. And that prescription um, lets us know where their start point is. And so you see these boxes at the bottom. Their start points into a curriculum. Wherever you start on the left, you finish the whole program. So that if you start at the readiness, you have a 14-week program. If you start at Read to Rise, you have a 10-week program. 
Scholars are for those kids who are less than a grade level behind. In our Beyond Basics intensive one-on-one -on -one tutoring program, we are able to get even kids who are reading at grade level, reading two grade levels above. And that's a tremendous boost for children, especially those that are college bound. And, and so uh, this really is for everyone, even those who can read, it's good for them to read better. And it is essential for the kids who are more than a grade level behind to get tutoring. Otherwise, we are wasting their educational dollars. And, and I'll end with saying that there was a literacy lawsuit. I don't know if you all, all of you heard about it, but it was uh, filed in 2015 on behalf of about six uh, public school kids in Detroit. Um, after all the appeals, they ended up being awarded $40,000 each and a hundred million, I think, that are going to five cities in our state over the next five years, giving them some literacy dollars for intensive work. Um, if we don't get in front of this, the lawsuits are gonna flourish. In Reno, Nevada, there was one that was just announced within the last few months where a family was awarded $340,000 because they went to private school and were refunded that money for that because they were able to get the intervention they need. Our program, on average, is $3,500 a child. It's one time they become readers and they're able to move on. A student like Elijah, a 12th grader reading at a first grade level, those are rare, more rare. They're usually reading at a fourth or a fifth grade level. Sometimes the kids need a double dose. And uh, when they just show up in some of the communities, you have, you know, it's hard for the kids to get to school. It takes longer for them to get that dosage. But, um, you know, our kids deserve this. They need it now. And, you know, when you look at K-12 education in Detroit, we're investing a little over $200,000 we should pay on average $3,500 so that they can access that $200,000 investment. Illiteracy is connected to almost every social ill in America. It leads to a lot of false narratives. People believe they can't when they, they are perfectly capable. And our work proves that you can be in the lowest performing school in the worst school district in our state, and you are able. And we know that now. What are we going to do that we know the kids are able and they just need a little bit of a boost? And so I appeal to you today to advocate for Beyond Basics uh, for our work. But if we embrace this as a state, you know, I um, we need to triage this. We need to do this as well as we can and as fast as we can. And we would love to oversee that initiative because we have been advocates for fighting that the kids get absolute what they, what they need. It's very easy to get literacy success and leave a child crippled. And we want to ensure that every child gets exactly what they need to be successful. And so I don't know if you've included the little... Um, video that we had. The next slide. Oh, good. So uh, this kind of summarizes this, uh, this speech. Um, if, uh, it's a two-minute video, so I think you'll find it interesting. You're looking at America's most precious resource, our children. And one key factor will determine whether any given child will become a benefit or a burden to society. That factor is... Yeah, I think they're going over the... Unfortunately, in Detroit Public Schools, four out of five students fall into the literacy gap. Is that okay? Can you guys understand it? Okay. The picture isn't any brighter in Lansing, Flint, or Pontiac. Even in Grand Rapids, three out of six school districts look like this. And increasingly, the children that fall into the literacy gap in Michigan are minority or economically disadvantaged. The costs of turning a blind eye to this problem are enormous. Consider this, Michigan will spend $15.5 billion in K-12 education this year. Statewide, 54% of our students fall into the literacy gap, which means that $8.4 billion of that investment will not be realized. But let's take a look at this from a student's point of view. Consider two 10-year-old students, both of whom fall into the literacy gap, assuming one of them bridges that gap while the other does not. By the time they reach 18, the pathways for their lives become vastly divergent. On average, a literate educated adult will earn fifty to sixty thousand dollars per year, while an illiterate adult will earn less. He'll be much more dependent on the twenty-seven billion dollars. 
Arts and Social Services, Michigan, spent here. Every year of their adult lives, there is a significant monetary gap that has its origins in the literacy gap. At Beyond Basics, we have a rather unique definition of illiteracy. It's America's largest and most solvable disability. In Detroit, for example, we can significantly improve the lives of 43,000 students for $3,000 per student. The issue we are addressing begins as a literacy gap, but it soon grows into a social justice gap and ultimately, as we've seen, a wealth gap. We have the tools at hand to close that gap. For over 15 years, Beyond Basics has impacted the lives and success of more than 90,000 students. Our methods are proven, powerful, and they transform lives in the average of six weeks. You're looking at America's most precious resource. Isn't it time we began treating them like it? So we have these uh, videos. There's another short video about a... Um, our work in a high school so you can see what the Beyond Basics room's like. We can send that via email so that you could watch them and maybe hear it a little more clearly. Uh, are there any questions? Yep, Commissioner Hoffman. Well, it's not really a question, it's just a comment, and we talked a little earlier before the meeting. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you very, very much for um, mm -hmm. uh, what you and Sean are doing and everybody else in your group. I remember a famous quote from Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. and it, you probably have heard it before, it's easier to be, build strong children than to fix broken men. Mm -hmm. And I think this is probably a step mm -hmm. in the right direction. I applaud you. I think yeah, all the you. resources should be put into place mm -hmm. because another saying I really like too is readers are leaders. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think it's so important because mm -hmm. without it you're lost. Yeah. And I do yeah. thank you guys yeah. again for what you're, you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yes. Mr. Powell, from a historical perspective, if you can answer this, when did, um, I know it's always been a challenge because I'm born and raised from Pontiac, but to see the increase now over spread over the whole county, um, which is, that's shocking. You know, when you look at how many students we have, that's over half, and it is everywhere now, you know. Mm -hmm. So my question is, even, and I know it, like a lot of the numbers you've given us is pre-COVID, so I could just imagine now, mm -hmm. all kids is affected. I don't care the color of your skin, where you live at, everybody's impacted on the educational, especially our high school kids. It's like, my daughter's in high school now, so I can understand what is really going on because there is a lot that they're not seeing, they don't know, and you know, programs like this is beneficial. Um, for all of us in all our districts. So my question is, sorry, I kind of went off a little bit. Mm -hmm. Historically, when did we start seeing the gap getting larger? Because it seems like, and I've been in government for a while now as far as working, but it's like, and I know Sean, I, we go back, he when he worked in his Congress, you know, when he was working for Congress, it's like, when did this start? How did it get so bad? And again, Oakland County, how? Mm -hmm. How? Yes, I think that as a society, we've made some really bad decisions over the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. And some of it is just evolving, you know? Sometimes things present themselves as good and we find out later it wasn't. But I think that, um, you know, I know that defunding parochial schools took some necessary, that individual, that relationship out of the picture. Changing the assessments hid it from us so that we didn't know that Elijah's reading at a first grade level. We just thought, oh, he's a little behind. Um, I know from speaking to families in the city of Detroit, they think that the drugs in the 80 really decimated the families and, and brought a lot of hardship to that community. But I do think just from a broader spiritual sense that if you have people suffering in your area and you don't tend to it, it spreads. And it ended up going under the radar. I think also you had the information age kick in with schools, and you had these overpopulation of areas, and schools were just trying to be, you know, technology, be the best they could, and they, they just had all these kids. We know that uh, you start to have two-parent um, workers in the home, so the schools were 
now latchkey. They were before and after. They were trying to pick up the the learning, uh, the parents' engagement. You know, the school was trying to pick it up. So they really were hit with a perfect storm. And um, you know, I so there's lots of little reasons. I think that we tend to, if we find yourself blaming, it means we're not solving. And so I look at it that it was a perfect storm. But we know this now. But we not only know it now. There's a solution, and every child should be tested in our schools, and every child should be given the literacy intervention they need. And the quicker that Michigan gets going with this, because look at we've piloted this in Detroit. If this works in Detroit, it can work anywhere, and this state can be a beacon of light for how to turn everything around. We have worked a couple pilot projects. One is Immokalee, Florida, with migrant children, uh, so there's a language barrier. But we've been in El Paso, you know? These are immigrant kids, 250,000 kids in the El Paso district, and literacy levels like you would find in 80%. Uh, illiterate. So th these states need this everywhere. And these are all people that can be powered at this time. So I think this is a perfect solution. You know, God's divine timing that we have something that can bring us together right now in, in all socioeconomic levels, in all cities, that we can come together. And it will take people coming together in the communities to fund it and to be tutors <laughs> and to get in there and help us parten and flatten the curve. Um, um, I, I guess I'll, I'll finish by this one comment. It's, Americans, we are very interesting people. We have tremendous heart, and we're willing to give up almost everything for someone else. That is true of us, even in this day when you hear us being ripped to shreds by people. The way we respond to natural disasters... I mean, where else do you, you're just willing to drop everything and go help. I mean, the latest one is the, the tornadoes in Kentucky. In a natural disaster, we don't blame we think it happened, we just, we just go help, we send our money. With these epidemics that sneak up on us over time, we blame. Yeah. We pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Aren't we given, the government's taking money. I think the government funding social services and taking it away from the faith-based communities. Faith-based communities went in and helped a person with relationship and their needs. The state just sends paper. And people need more than paper. They need each other to pick them up. And so we haven't been good at solving those problems that sneak up on us over time. But they are solvable, and, and we need to come together and do it. So this is America's problem right now. And there is a solution. And the sooner we get going, the better off we'll all be. I just got one more question. Are there any current Oakland County districts or schools y'all working with now? We've worked in Pontiac in years past. Uh, I'd say a couple years before, there was a change uh, uh, the district. It's like when the state was almost taking the school district over. We ended up, you know, it was, just got more confusing, so we pulled out that year. That was a couple years before COVID. Um, but, you know, I definitely would like to be back in Pontiac um, and uh, Benton Harbor and Flint and Lansing and a lot of these communities. So, I will say too, we we uh, have a foothold in the archdiocese schools and some of the parochial schools. The districts open up some uh, title dollars for us to do work with some of the private schools, and that's going very well also. So, any other questions or comments? Commissioner McGilvery. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Uh, what would you say might be the average uh, funding cost? for a district, school district? So if we were to pull that slide up, if you take the number of kids in the gap and you just say $3,500 a student, um, the districts that are on par with Detroit's numbers are gonna be 3,500. Districts that are you know, maybe more high achieving, they may not be as far behind, but it's a good average number to work with. Um, but it's 3,500, so I think we didn't put the price. I also have a price tag of literacy, and I think uh, you you are, you're all sitting down, right? I think it's like 220 million dollars for Oakland County, which is a lot. Um, but that's why we have to look to the state and to public, private. You know, we have been philanthropically funded all these years. There are a lot of um, businesses 
that would be happy to help with initiative like this. So my recommendation is that we would choose the highest achieving and the lowest achieving district, or one of those low achieving districts in Oakland County, that we would go in and get every child and pilot it just to start bringing every child who's ca capable and every child in the gap into the forefront because we have that opportunity here. And I don't know of other intensive programs like this around the country. I've looked for them. I think because we had to raise the money for it over the years and it wasn't necessarily easy. Um, you know, it, it's, but we need to show people that the kids in their schools are capable. So uh, I think that answers your question. So 3,500 times the literacy gap number. And, and how do you come up with that? that gap number? So we can look, so it's uh, on state records. You can go and look at the way each school district tested in. It's interesting, I think the schools track the data because they get more dollars depending on how far a student is behind. Some of them call in learning differences disabilities. So they put tiers around their kids, a tier one, a tier two, a tier three, a tier four, and those correlate with literacy tests. And so a tier one is gonna be that student that's about a grade level behind. So we're able to identify how many kids are in the gap by the tests that really go to show disability in other areas. So there's state education tests that we pull and come up with those figures. Uh, I have a little experience. My daughter's a reading specialist in, mm -hmm. in uh, public school. Great. And she's the one that measures their reading levels. And stuff, yeah. so. Have you made the presenta this presentation to the school districts to try to get them involved? In yes. Yeah, I mean, tip, you know, when we started out, we just partnered with principals, raised dollars, partnered with principals, did our work in the schools. Uh, Detroit had an emergency financial manager for years, so it wasn't until we got a regular superintendent that was dyslexic as a child, so he understood stood this. In Pontiac, we worked with the superintendents. Depending on the superintendent and the curriculum team, they're going to feel like they're addressing this and not want an outside partner. So that has been, if there's an obstacle in being embraced, it is at that administrative level. But once they're able to see, I mean, Beyond Basics doesn't want to stay there. We just want to help flatten that curve. We want to be a partner that we're just, you know, going to help you get your kids literate, send literate kids into the classroom. And then we want the districts to start doing this moving forward. Um, once they see the growth of the kids and they, I think they kind of blame themselves for it and think they should solve it. But uh, opening it up and being willing to have a partner come in, it's a really lovely partnership in the schools. And we can take you all on tours, the one that's Angela's. Uh, Detroit's back in person uh, as of this week. And so uh, anytime you'd like to take a tour and uh, see, we take you right into school, see our room. Um, but it, we work really well with the, the principals and the teams in, in the schools. But it'd be great to speak to your daughter. What district's she in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I so she's very aware of this, and she knows that intensive one-on-one -on -one helps. You know, I've just been bold enough to say, let's do it. <laughs> you know, because uh, they, you know, they're looking at the teachers. How can a teacher do that? But no, they need some partners. Just like with COVID, the hospitals needed partners. You know, they're the hurricane. People need police, fire. They all need help when they have a crisis. And education has a crisis right now, and it's literacy. Yes, Angela. Oh, I, can I? Oh. Sure. Um, are you partnering? Well, I had heard you earlier. Never mind. You stated it that you had met with some mayors. Um, with Ethan Baker, we did in Troy, yes. Yeah, no, I yeah. was just thinking of another angle for Pontiac schools, that's all. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we should be in Pontiac. And uh, I mean, if you really want to do it, I'm, I'll go to folks I know too and try and fund oh, yeah, it no, I didn't already privately. Send text. But so I get with Sean. I already sent yeah. text messages. Yeah, we'd love to be back there. You know, we we were there for years. It's yeah, one I of just, the first districts. I just districts. asked if we're not with you all, what, what, what organization is tackling literacy issues in the district? So I'm just waiting to see what they say. And then I'll be in touch. I'll have some conversations. So the that. question is, what literacy interventionists around are doing intensive one-on-one, -on -one, an hour a day, five days a week? There's a lot of literacy interventions, but they've basically, so this is another problem in America. We've created pipelines of money 
yeah. and then we start serving for what that pipeline pays for. Mm -hmm. The pipeline in education, the literacy coaches, so all of the, the governors putting more money in literacy coaches, they're putting more money in the less than a grade level behind intervention. I call it the amoxicillin of illiteracy. That's where most literacy providers they have a program that works for kids that are less than a grade level behind. They read a couple times a week. We want to ensure that kids get what they need, and that is intensive one-on-one, -on -one, an hour a day, five days a week. And so the question after they give you this list is to look at their what they're providing. And um, it isn't for this group. It isn't for the 84% that you have in Pontiac. They're not getting what they need. You know, if we stick with amoxicillin, amoxicillin works for some. Some need surgery. And the 84% in the gap need the surgery. And that's what is missing across America is the intensive one-on-one -on -one intervention, an hour a day, five days a week. And with it, you get kids reading. And that's what we need to be zealous about. Thank you. So, we have yeah. an Oakland County Literacy Council mm -hmm. here. Um, I, my understanding is they work with adults generally as English, English as a second language. So this program would complement and be in addition to what we already provide. And I absolutely agree with the words you've spoken today. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And you know, I will say one other flaw, I mean, for, for years the government has been funding adults in literacy, and we say, why haven't we seen the results of that? Mm -hmm. They require that adults in vulnerable communities come to them, and you have to have the consistency. Mm -hmm. And so they're not getting enough, enough of the dosage. And so yes, those adults would benefit from intensive one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we just need to get going. They need our help. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank Here. you. Uh, Commissioner Kuhn, uh, this is, we're receiving and filing this report in presentation today, but next steps, what, what would you like to see as next steps in order to move this program forward? Well, thank you, uh, mm -hmm. Madam Chair, and thank mm -hmm. you for uh, having this presentation mm -hmm. today. I think it's very illuminating. I, I was just shocked. I mean, I don't know if other people weren't, but the level of uh, need here is just very dramatic. Uh, actually, I believe in talking with Hillary Chambers that the administration has some proposal, some um, proposal that they're going to come up with in the next month or so. Does that include this program? I believe it does. I was speaking with, so um, Hillary and I crossed paths a few years ago. Uh, when she was running Reading Works. Mm -hmm. And then David Woodward came to visit our programs and tour it. And then he mentioned us to her, and then she connected with me. And so they have some learning loss dollars, and they're trying to figure out how to do some sort of pilot. And I think that this was one, one piece to open it up to the commissioners here and see if people are on board for supporting an initiative like this. Um, Yes. And, you know, I, I know Tom is very concerned, too, about the colleges. You know, Beyond Basics can help those bridge program students also. So once you've graduated, what do you do? Where do you go to get this? And if the, the colleges, the universities offered intensive one-on-one -on -one literacy, they would find that many more of those kids could actually participate at the, the community college and the, you know, university level. And so it is another population, and um, this is the one last, one last population that is on our radar is the juvenile centers. You know, you have kids that basically get into trouble because they they leave school, they can't read. It's not for them. And um, we have some conversations in Wayne County right now about going into those juvenile detention centers and getting those kids literate. And so um, they're hiding out in lots of places because we haven't addressed this for probably. For, for five decades. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Cavell? Yeah, I just wanted to give yeah. kudos again. Hey, again, yeah. Pam. Um, I used to be a social worker in Detroit Public Schools, and mm -hmm. so uh, the premise that you start with all of us being created equal and then somewhere along the way things get gunked up mm -hmm. structurally, I understand and empathize with that, and I appreciate the work you're doing. Yeah. So thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Kuhn and mm -hmm. Chair Loops for bringing her in. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate yeah. it, Charlie. Yeah. So, 
Yes, Pam Good and Sean Ciaventi, great job. Yes, thank you. Thank you. We appreciate uh, it. All right. Um, we, we have a motion and a second to re receive and file this report. Moving forward, we can check in with administration to see where we go. I think uh, everybody is overwhelmingly positive about moving forward with this. So uh, for receiving filing, roll call, please. I'm sorry. If our voice vote. <sighs> Commissioner McGilvery moved it, and it was supported by... Commissioner Powell. Um, mm -hmm. okay. Can we count the vote up? If you must. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> That's an item. <laughs> we have nine yeas, zero nays. <clears throat> hey. Uh, we received in file. Thank you so much for your Thank time. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, next item is appropriating American Rescue Plan Act local fiscal recovery funds for the school mental health fund initiative under the Oakland Together Mental Health and Wellbeing School Partnership Grant Program to support the cost of direct mental health services. Uh, I don't, would anybody like to make a motion? I have a motion by Commissioner Gershenson, support from who? Support from Commissioner Cavell. So this is an item we've been talking about, thank you, for <clears throat> a few months. This was related to the Navigator program um, that we approved and we're waiting for additional facts to move forward supporting the cost of direct mental health services. I don't know if you remember with the Navigator program, that contract was beginning in January with OCHN to begin the process of hiring a Navigator to support referrals through the school district. The second piece is monies to support Copays and deductibles for mental health services. Oh, and we have, um, oh, thank you. I see Rudy Hobbs here. So Rudy, would you like to add to this? Yeah, I'm gonna see if, uh, see if I can ping Adam here also uh, to see, I see that he's on, there he goes. Hey, Adam. Hello. Uh, well, first of all, I really wanna thank the commissioners for uh, giving us an opportunity to come before the committee and uh, kind of share a little bit more details, answer some more questions. Uh, I definitely understand the, you know, the need to ask questions so for us to give you, you know, very thorough answers, uh, you know, to your questions. And so that's why Adam and I are here today. Uh, I know that we have uh, sent over, you know, uh, not only, you know, a new resolution, an amended resolution, but also kind of like a one pager, just kind of give you a sense of, you know, how we plan to approach this, you know, as it relates to CAPS. Uh, you know, for those families that are seeking services or seeking uh, reimbursement for their cost. Uh, and so, you know, understand there's a $2,000 cap for that. Uh, I really would like to just kind of open the floor up to kind of really figure out, you know, what questions, you know, what more can we describe about this program to make you feel comfortable in supporting today? But Rudy, I understand, um for co-pays and deductibles, it's first come, first served, uh, up to $2,000. So based on the amount of money, how many families would that service? Uh, Adam, do you want to jump in real quick with that detail? Yeah, well, sure. So, I mean, if it's, it's approximately a million dollars, if we assume, you know, every person utilizes the full $2,000, then that's 500 families, although, um, you know, that's a, that assumption I don't think is gonna apply in all cases. And yeah, I think one of the, the key things that the, the navigator role will, will do is look at the resources available to a family relative to um, opportunities to receive services in the community that might also be low cost or no cost and explore other available benefits. So in many cases, it may be the case that a family uh, can be connected with something that doesn't really require that they uh, tap into this fund. I think the only other thing I will add to that is that there is a, 
uh, very strong interest uh, given what happens at today's meeting. The, the Bomber Group would match, uh, the Bomber Foundation would match our million dollars with a million dollars. So it would make it a $2 million uh, fund. Thank you. So let's say a family um, is in need of a copay being paid. How, how do they apply? How is it approved? What is that process? So what we're looking at is a situation where the family would connect with our navigator. Our navigator is going to uh, be able to ask some questions, gather some information, and then if it appears the family needs connection to a service provider, we can then explore uh, what what arrangements might be need to be made with that service service provider. Do they have the ability to work on a sliding scale? Can they reduce fees? Gathering lots of information on a case by case basis to get a sense of what the out of pocket costs would be to that family. If the uh, family is going to then go forward with utilizing some of those supports, we would. Uh, issue to them a letter detailing, you know, the supports that they're eligible for and get rele appropriate releases. I think what we're looking at is having the providers being able to invoice us directly, um, although we have our legal exploring this a little bit further. Um, and our, and uh, then we have somebody in our budget finance, de finance department that will manage the invoices, track the funds to each family and the number of services covered to each family and um, make the payments directly to the service provider. Is a service provider a fair market provider uh, or those contracted with OCHN or both? Who, who would be the provider? Um, it, would, it would be on a case-by-case -case basis determined uh, based on the need of the individual, the service that's in need, uh, relative to where the family is situated within the county and, and what's available to them there. It's, there's no stipulation that it be someone who's in network with OCHN or anything along those lines. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Gershenson. Thank you. Um, and I really do appreciate all your hard work on this. Um, when Commissioner Spiz after Oxford came and let us know that there actually were families that could not afford their copay, it really did sway me in favor of this resolution. I have two questions. Um, are the navigators, what's the professional background of the navigators? The navigators are masters prepared mental health professionals. We require that they be licensed. Um, Typically, they're going to be master's level social workers, counselors, psychologists. But they are only doing the navigation. They're not giving services to the schools um, for, for mental health services? The design of the program is that the schools can, or families, can connect directly with the navigators, um, and they would conduct some brief intervention assessment linked to something more long term where that's appropriate. And um, if, all, if this money is not used, what's the reporting mechanism to come back to us and say, we've, on, we've only used this amount? What's the, the time frame? You know, I think it's our plan to come back to you guys uh, and offer a report uh, to, to this committee, I believe quarterly, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, so we'll have an opportunity that you'll have an opportunity uh, to see, you know, exactly how those dollars are being used. Uh, I would anticipate that, you know, that we find ourselves in a situation where the money is not being used. Uh, I think we can have a conversation and figure out, you know, uh, how to, you know, repurpose uh, those dollars if we find that the dollars are being used. Well, certainly that's something I'm sure this committee would like is, is to have some sort of reporting back about the efficacy. Let's put it in a resolution. I just can't remember if I put uh, yeah. if I put it in a month uh, quarterly. Uh, right. Yes. The time, but I did put something in the resolution that we will come back to this committee and, and provide a report. And a Adam, record. how long do you think it's going to take to get this up and running? Uh, we've actually already been interviewing the navigators and um, are in the prime. I was early as. 
today I was, uh, or as recently as today, I was in conversation developing, you know, processes and procedures around managing the uh, distribution of the, the funds for copays and deductibles. So I think we can stand that up very quickly. Okay, thank you. Adam, how many navigators will, are, are being hired? We've posted for four positions um, in this hiring market that's ambitious, although we have had several applicants already. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Commissioner Jackson, followed by Commissioner Cavell, and then Commissioner Power. Oh, okay, thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to say I think that this is a very, very needed and responsible program, and I applaud um, just the effort that was undergone in bringing this to us. Um, what I want to say is um, just for um, us to know, programs like this to help um, lower income people are, are greatly needed because working individuals, I'm sure most of us are aware that we have um, access to mental health services uh, during our employers, uh, with our employers, um, and they call them employee assistance programs. And um, the low income people, a lot of times just get slighted just because they might not be um, or have the benefit of an employer that would pay deductibles or offer counseling um, to, um, to the students. And also, information is power. And just the role of the navigator helping um, people through the system because, um, you know, there's a lot of red tape involved, a lot of red tape in finding the proper um, therapists and the proper people to look at the student. And then that help goes on with helping families um, look at mental health services uh, with less stigma, um, less concern about um, them being, you know, harmed further through therapy, might not, you know, might not even be aware of the help that they could get. So I really appreciate this, uh, this program and, and we'll be in support of it because I know our community, um, especially now, our children, um, are in need of this. This is following a thread of conversation that we had earlier in a, a, a committee, earlier committee meeting. Um, we have to make sure that our um, mental health care is first and foremost now for our students because they're suffering through an unknown situation. We don't know how this is going to come out. Um, so thank you. Thank you for bringing this before us. Thank you. Commissioner Cavell. Thank you, Chair. Uh, all the conversation made me think of a couple of things, Adam and Rudy. Um, one, is this for students? I guess it says services for students in schools. But yeah, just confirming, this is for students, correct? Not students adults. and families. Students and families, okay. Mm -hmm. And then this says that there's funding set aside. This is funding for low-income families, but then it's also uh, available on a first-come, first-served basis. How do you thread that needle to make sure that, as Commissioner Jackson was just saying, you make sure you reach the greatest need? Adam, I'll let you tackle it. Yeah, so one of the things that we're looking at right now, obviously we want to use the money um, to support the families where there is real need and where the, and who are most in need. So one of the things that we're looking at now is um, looking at uh, the family's income relative to the federal poverty level and then maybe trying to target um, families with 200%, within 200% of the federal poverty level um, or below um, to see how we can stretch these dollars to, to have the most impact where it's most needed. Okay, I, I don't mean to push too much, but th if this is gonna be a 500 family person program doubled by Balmer Foundation, that's a thousand families. There's 210,000 children in Oakland County at 200% federal poverty line that's still, you know, dozens of tens of thousands. <coughs> Any other sussing out there if there's 5,000 people that qualify and 3,000 who apply and there's only money for 1,000? Or is it, I think that, yeah. I think the other pieces you should understand too, I think that, you know, if you are, you know, if you are, uh, 
a recipient of Medicaid, you know, OCHN is already going to provide these services for you, mm -hmm. right? You know, so you know, there's going to be, you know, that that middle group that we're talking about. And I understand what you're saying. There's going to be a lot of families, uh, but I think that, you know, from, you know, do we think that every family is going to, you know, you know seek out the services? Uh, probably not, you know. But this is also, you know, at the very beginning of this, you know, we really talked about, you know, with the with Oakland ISD and some of the social workers there, you know, when we asked them, hey, how do we help you? You know, one of the things they said, that there, there's just certain cases, you know, there are certain situations, there are certain kids that our, that our school psychologists, our school counselor and social workers are just not skilled enough to work with, right? You know, and so, you know, we're hoping that, you know, by, you know, by a school recommending to, you know, these uh, navigators, hey, you know, here's a case that we just can't do anything about. Uh, I think that, you know, having navigators, you know, having, you know, a, you know, master level social worker type of background, you know, they will be very comfortable in saying that, hey, look, I think this is something that could be handled at the school level, right? With these interventions, I think a school counselor or social worker could really handle this. And then there's going to be cases that come to them and say, hey, look, this is well beyond what I think you can handle at the schools with the resources that you have. And so and that's kind of where that's kind of where we want to, you know, fill the gap. The gap is, you know, really kind of looking at some of the extreme cases, you know, that are happening in schools. Uh, you know, again, this is from principals and superintendents uh, whom I meet with every single Tuesday, uh, you know, at three o'clock. You know, this is kind of from them. Like, there's just certain cases we can't handle. And what we don't want to do is have deductibles and co-pays be barriers and obstacles you know, to us serving, you know, those, you know, very extreme, unique cases. So I hope that makes sense, uh, Commissioner Cavell. Is, you know, we're not looking to, you know, there's going to be some cases that we may have to say, um, you know, we think those resources can be available at the schools. And I think we all are aware that the schools have received, you know, ARP dollars directly. And so a lot of schools have already started to do a little bit around, you know, mental health and, you know, really addressing some of the needs at the schools. Uh, but then there's going to be cases where I just don't, don't think that, you know, they need a professional. They need somebody outside of the school, uh, more of an expert clinician that can really be, you know, really step in and be helpful. And I think those are the cases that we're looking for. Okay, thank you for that perspective. I appreciate that. Uh, now I have a better grapple on what you're going for here. Um, one last question, sure. if you don't mind. Which you'd mentioned the schools get ARP dollars and Oakland schools, I think, got $180 million? In no, Oakland, Oakland schools have received the dollars directly. Okay. Okay. So then they're, they won't be able to help chip in and make this like a three-way grant. It's just no. going to be Balmer no. and us. Okay. Understood. Balmer and us. Not that you wouldn't have asked already, Rudy, but yeah. All right. Thank you. No idea. Yeah, right? I Rudy, how does the navigator receive their referrals? Uh, I think the referrals can come from, you know, any number of folks, right? I mean, I think the family can directly, you know, contact the navigator. Uh, I envision uh, that a school counselor, uh, you know, I will hope they will have our navigators on speed dial, you know, for cases that, you know, that they feel like they can't handle at the schools. Uh, I think that, you know, there could be a pastor in the in a community that was that, you know, that's aware of our program, have knowledge of our program. and really thinks that, you know, someone from their congregation could be, bene you know, could benefit uh, from this program. So it can be a number of ways. I don't think that, you know, that the navigator, you know, will have just, you know, one access point, you know, and that's the schools. I don't envision that. I think that, you know, someone raised that very early in our conversation, uh, and I absolutely agree with them that a navigator should be able to, you know, uh, be accessible to anyone in the community. And then it's their responsibility at that point you know, to, you know, you know, assess the situation and, you know, and provide next steps for that family, whether that's next steps with, you know, our providers uh, to be a part of this program or, you know, to really work with, you know, Southfield Public Schools and say, hey, I got a kid that, you know, that came in from their pastor, you know, I want to learn more about the, you know, resources that you have there before I put them in this program. Well, how, how are the families and the pastors and the schools going to know to refer to the navigator? Well, I think OCHN, you know, through some of, uh, you know, their networks and their, uh, you know, 
some of their avenues, whether it's website, you know, uh, you know, whether it's some of their partners that they may have in terms of getting out resources to make it knowledgeable. I'm actually stepping out of a meeting right now, uh, you know, th that really talks about how do we make our county services, you know, more accessible, uh, you know, make sure that people have knowledge uh, of our programs and what does that look like? So I think that, you know, through our ability at the county to, you know, work with our, I mean, our partners, whether they grassroots or, you know, other organizations, uh, I think we share this broadly with people. Yeah. Kind of like we do with other services. Commissioner Powell? We, we com oh, I'm sorry. I was I was simply going to add to Rudy's comments that we committed early on to having a, a single uh, one-stop shop phone line d dedicated to this, and we have uh, we're we're working to embed um, you know a person managing that phone to directly support the navigators <laughs> and the navigators alone. So we think that'll make this, the flow of communication on our end very seamless for people reaching out for those services. And in terms of outreach, we'll, we'll plan a, a big communication push. Uh, we're, we're well connected with the ISD and um, in other programs and other school districts, we have some, some activities going on where we can um, leverage those connections. Um, and then, you know, of course, we'll, we'll work with, uh, uh, you know, partners across the community who might have inroads as well. But you know, this this is this is something we're fairly adept at doing. So we're quite confident that we'll be able to uh, make those connections uh, quickly. Thank you, Commissioner Powell. Um, I don't know from a, a just how we do processes. He stated that there would be a possible match. Is there any way that that can be listed? Do we need that listed here just as a possible match just for our knowledge so we can cover our bases in this conversation we're having with the executive team? Um, I just didn't know if they did that in the past before, and I'll divert to Marsha for guidance on this, if we should list it or, you know, or also to Mr. Hobbs. Um, I know it's a potential uh, match. I just didn't know if we needed, if my colleagues, if we needed to list that. Just for our knowledge and, our, and just as a point for our conversation and we can put in there possible match or I didn't know if, you know, I'm, I'm seeking out to my veterans here. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's something y'all we would usually do or not. Cause it's not listed here. Mm -hmm. Now the quarterly report is listed. Thank you for that, Rudy. But I just didn't know since he said it's a potential. I didn't know if we list that or not. So I'll divert to our veterans my here. My preference will be, you know, uh, is to allow us to, you know, put the MOU together uh, with uh, Balmer. Uh, what I shared with them in my in all transparency, uh, you know, when we were talking about this. Um, Back in November, uh, they committed uh, verbally to support this program. I asked Ms. Kylie Mitchell, who runs the Bomber Group, I asked her if this was something that they'd be interested in. She said, absolutely. She asked how much. Mm -hmm. I told her to match our million. She said, if we could do that. Uh, she reached out to me early January and asked, asked if we were still moving forward with this. I told her that we were, uh, and I needed to get a uh, committee vote. She said, once you get a committee vote, uh, to show that you guys are committed to it, let me know, and then I will start the process on my side. So that that would mean once this passes through this committee and, and for board approval that you would come back with an amendment to this to add the bomber group. I don't. I don't. I would. I would say to the committee. Uh, I don't think that you know whether we get a match from Bomber should decide whether or not we move forward with it. I think a match from Bomber is just the icing on the cake, and that's just a plus. Uh, I don't think that yeah. if we don't get a match from Bomber, which I'm pretty confident we will, but I don't think that should stop us from, you know, having this fund in place uh, and up and running and moving forward. I wasn't stating for us to not vote for it in support of it. I just wanted the additional information so we can keep it on our radar, on our end of what was being discussed with you and Balmer so that we know that there is a potential match and it will be listed in this as a potential match for I'm us fine. to remember. I'm, I'm fine with that. Not saying not to vote for it, not none of that. I just wanted it to be on our radar that we do have a potential match. Commissioner Gershenson. Yeah, just to refresh everybody's memory, 
back at the last meeting, there was a resolution about this match with the bomber group. However, since the resolution got changed at that December 9th meeting, that was pulled. But there, there has always been the understanding that this, there was a good chance. But if Angela, right. you want to, um, if we, if we want to add some, no, amendment. you cleared it up. I just want to make no. sure we got it somewhere that we got it on our radar that there is a potential match because what is presented in our notes right now, there is nothing that says that at least with this. I'm okay with it being on there prior. I get all that. As long as we got it somewhere, that's fine. It's on your radar. I'm good with it. Definitely. I'm we my We can radar. disregard and move well, forward. The, the match was with the first navigator. So now you're saying there will be another match for the copay and deductible. Mm -hmm. No, uh, Commissioner, this is Barbara. I think there was a misunderstanding. The, the bomber uh, was matching the community in school program, which was the par part of the mental health and well-being. Uh, uh, thank and you. this yeah. is the first time we're, I, you know, I think we're hearing about that amazing opportunity and possibility from bomber. So uh, to Commissioner Powell, we can figure it out if we need it prior to the board meeting. So we don't, as of now, we're just approving or just we are approving a million dollars for the um, direct uh, pays thank you barbara it's on barbara's radar thank you very much any other questions or comments uh, prompt the vote please Nelson? Uh, she she oh, that's why. <laughs> we have eight yeas, zero nays. All right, motion carries. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you. Our, Thanks. Our next item is transfer of ownership and release of claims agreement for canine dog bread. A motion by Commissioner Hoffman, support from Commissioner McGilvery. And we have Gay up here here. Welcome. Good afternoon, commissioners. So this is just a routine um, canine retirement. So canine Brig has uh, reached about eight years. I think he's about eight years old. Um, he was a narcotics canine and he has reached retirement age. So we're asking for your approval to transfer ownership to his handler. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, prompt the vote, please. We have eight yeas, zero nays. All right, motion carries. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you under sheriff. <laughs> Our next <laughs> item is from 270 to build additional outside kennels. I have a motion from Commissioner Hoffman, support from Commissioner Gershenson. And who do we have here? Joni Tool. Thank you. Welcome. Is Joni here? So this, um, the Oakland County Shelter and Pet Adoption Center has been awarded a $30,000 grant to be used towards the construction of outside dog kennels at the shelter. I don't know that anybody's here to, uh, to answer I it. I see Bobcat, but he's muted, so I don't know. Uh, okay. Mr. Yeah. So um. the, this would accept the grant funding uh, to partially fund outside kennels for the dogs. The project consists of design and construction of additional outdoor kennels estimated to be $133,507. So this is a grant for $30,000, an acceptance of the grant for $30,000. Any comments? All right, roll call, please. Yes, zero nays. All right, motion carries. Thank you. The last item on our agenda is appropriating American Rescue Plan Act local fiscal recovery funds for the Oakland Together Housing Security Initiative as an informational item. 
I have a, mo a motion uh, by Commissioner Cavell, support from Commissioner Powell. And our chair is here to address this. Great. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm just going to kind of tee it up um, and appreciate the committee uh, beginning the process to uh, review this. Um, as one of the next like, ARPA allocations, there are a number of the work groups and ideas that are working through the process. I think it's, um, I mean, this is an opportunity for this policy committee to really uh, dig deep into. Um, it, tr working towards achieving the core objective, which is to make sure that I mean, we use these dollars to maximize impact, uh, to be transformational, to solving uh, problems, uh, long-term effect, and I mean, where possible, leveraging additional dollars to uh, do, um, to uh, to improve the lives of the, the the community that we serve. So this particular one in housing, and I want to commend everyone. I know there's many people around this table been working on this issue, talking about this issue, um, dealing with, I mean, frankly, an issue that is incredibly complicated. Um, I don't think that it's a surprise that we've got a housing crisis in this country. Um, it is an incredibly complicated issue. It's not unique to anywhere in this country. I am mean, in this county, in the state. Across, I mean, every state is, is dealing with this challenge. Just to kind of put it to scale, uh, we've got about 135,000 uh, lower wage jobs um, in Oakland County. I mean, that's, and that, um, by 2023, about 135,000 jobs. Those jobs are absolutely essential to power the. Um, the power of the economy. You'll hear me, I mean, you'll regularly hear me talk about those at the bottom end, I mean, the, the income scale. They're on the front lines of the economy. They're the ones that spend most of their money um, uh, being able to meet basic needs, including housing. And given the complexity of this issue, everything from homelessness without a place to be to, uh, I mean, in, in, uh, the quality of existing housing stock, the affordability and attainability of housing, as well as the, the need for new housing construction. Like all of these things kind of come together and, uh, and, and it's an opportunity in Oakland County to lean in to actually play a uh, proactive uh, role in improving that. So, I mean, you all have seen the, the blueprint to uh, end homelessness in Oakland County. I think there's a lot of ideas in there that also kind of like nicely mesh with what we're, what, I mean, what some of these ideas that have kind of percolated as some best practices that can achieve some of these core, uh, I mean, these core objectives. Uh, so today, as you guys kind of talk about uh, four particular strategies um, that are outlined in these proposals, just kind of I wanted to share like, where we are like, in this process. Uh, we continue to work with the administration that uh, embraces um, a lot. I mean, these these strategies um, uh, still working through the process of, uh, I mean, figuring out what's the, what's the optimal and best funding stream, because there are multiple funding streams that are available to us to help achieve these things, and looking at long-term and how to actually roll these things out. Um, I'm optimistic in the coming weeks and, and hopefully at the next committee meeting that we can have the administration kind of talk in kind of what they're thinking from a, the financing aspect of this. Uh, but today there's an opportunity to bring in, uh, and we're so fortunate in Oakland County to have some of the best housing experts in the space to be able to talk about this, to, I mean, to get everyone, I mean, understanding what the, the what these policy ideas and solutions are and can um, and get answers to any questions that come up, but move this through a process. Um, as the policy committee, kind of like, does this align with what we want to accomplish? And then, of course, the finance committee that will delve a little bit more to make sure, okay, what buckets of monies that we allocate to it in total and from what pots they come through and how are we going to continue to evaluate not just the, the dollar allocation, but make sure that we identify what are the key metrics for success that we want to evaluate, evaluate to hold ourselves to account so that we're, we, we have some assurance that we are improving the problem, making progress to end homelessness in this country, um, and most importantly, uh, to assure that anyone who works in Oakland County has a, I mean, can earn enough to um, live in a place uh, to continue to work in Oakland County. So. Without any further ado, I, I'm going to kick it over to Commissioner Cavell that I think can I mean, introduce the uh, experts that we have, um, I believe, on the screen behind us. Oh, there they are. Um, and again, I again thank you for the committee's consideration as we begin, as we begin this process. And uh, I mean, I think it's going to be a thoughtful, I mean, I know there's a lot of information that's already in your packet, and we've got the experts to answer questions. Thank you, Chair. So who we have here today, and as you'll see in the packet, the resolution for housing security, first again, like Chair said, was created with lots of us here around this table, so thanks again to y'all. Um, but first, 
the, the three big items out of the four are an attainable housing trust fund, which Mark Craig is here to speak to, the CEO and founder of CHN. Uh, we have the Shelter Capacity Fund, which Leah McCall, the C uh, president of the Alliance for Housing, is here to speak to. And then Roops, Ramps, and Repairs Program, Redux, you know, 2.0, which Tim Ruggles, CEO and president of Habitat for Humanity Oakland County, is here to speak to. So if I could, Chair, if, if it's all right, to just let Mark, Leah, and Tim just kind of give a 30-second overview of the things yep. and then? Yep. Okay. we would love to hear from each of them. So then take it away. Let's do Mark, Leah, and then Tim. Okay. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, very briefly, Community Housing Network is an affordable housing developer and a provider of housing-related supportive services. Uh, one of the services that we provide is a uh, operating uh, housing resource center, which currently gets over a thousand calls a month from uh, citizens of Oakland County who are experiencing some sort of housing challenge. And far and away, affordability and accessibility to um, housing is the biggest challenge that we hear from people. Uh, and that's people who are cost burdened, people who are working uh, and but not making enough to cover all of their basic needs, uh, all the way through to people at the lower income spectrum, who people with disabilities, people who are relying on us to make sure that they have a roof over their head. Because uh, housing has been identified as a what's called a key determinant of po population health, meaning that if you don't have a safe, secure, uh, attainable, affordable roof over your head, that your chances of succeeding in mental health treatment, your chances of succeeding in uh, getting your kids into a quality education, your chances of uh, becoming, uh, increasing your employment uh, ability and skills are uh, very, very limited. So affordable housing trust funds or attainable housing trust funds have been uh, piloted in many, many hundreds of communities across the country. Uh, a lot of this information is described in attachment A that's, uh, that accompanies your uh, uh, resolution. But uh, just to hit on a few brief uh, concepts. First of all, one of the key concepts in this is that there is a, huge need in, as Commissioner Woodward said, uh, in Oakland County and in almost every community across the state in terms of people, um, working people, people with disabilities, people who've been homeless and others uh, experiencing severe cost challenges. And this has been highly exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, rents in Oakland County have, have continued to go up. We see people on a very regular basis who may have access to another housing resource like a voucher, for example, which is uh, kind of the uh, gold standard of uh, housing resources that we can make available to people. And yet they can't find an attainable unit where, that they can rent and the voucher goes back to Lansing or to Washington. So uh, there's a huge pent up need for, um, for housing, uh, maintaining the existing affordable housing that we have and developing literally thousands of new units of affordable housing to, to serve the needs of our citizens of our community. Uh, the other thing I'd like to make underscore for you is this whole notion of leveraging, because this is truly an opportunity to make a once in a lifetime strategic investment in housing. Uh, and housing developers like uh, Habitat, like Community Housing Network, and many others that are working in the county right now to try and uh, keep people safely and affordably and stably housed um, need additional resources that we can then leverage to attract more investment uh, in our community. Um, just to use the number that's been thrown out in the resolution so far, if there was a $20 million housing um, fund set up for Oakland County, then I would estimate that that would attract over $200 million in investment and economic uh, development in this in this county. It would generate jobs. It would generate uh, safe, decent places for people to live. Uh, it would generate, you know, activity at local businesses, restaurants, everything. So this is not only an investment, a social investment, but it's also an economic investment in the county. 
And I guess I've touched on the points that I wanted to hit. This is very closely related to the work that we've all done and appreciated on the uh, um, blueprint and homelessness. So, but it's not only about homelessness, it's about working people who need a safe place to live. Thank, thank you, Mark. I know I've referred many people to Community Housing Network. It's a good program. Thank Le you. Thank you. Leah? Is there anything you'd Hi. like to add? Yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I don't have anything specific on, on the Affordable Housing Trust. Would you like me to talk a little bit about the Shelter Capacity Fund? Sure. Okay, great. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I am with the Alliance for Housing, which is the continuum of care for Oakland County. Um, and, and really just speaking today about, you know, some of the needs that we have for shelter and, and here to answer any questions that you might have. I would say that um, shel the shelter need is not new in, in Oakland County, but I would say it's definitely been exacerbated by, by COVID and the need um, has been seen more probably in the community than, than it was before. We've always needed additional beds um, and we really had to pivot um, because some of the, the ways that we do shelter in a congregate setting really didn't work during a pandemic. So, um, for example, we have about 70 to 90 um, additional people that we are hoteling in addition to the normal sort of 30 that would have been in one of our rotating shelters. So we are closely meeting the capacity of the need in our community with those additional beds and units for shelter. Um, and I think that, you know, new shelter in the community really just gives individuals an opportunity to connect with resources, be in a safe place, and then move quickly onto affordable housing in our community. Uh, so um, if there's any questions or, you know, anything specific you'd like to ask or anything, I, I would love to answer for you. Thank you. Do you, do you work with or facilitate the Section 8 housing or the announcement of Section 8 is now open in this city or area? So we did receive that from the state, from MISHTA, and we pushed that out on our listserv. We don't always push some of those things out, but for Oakland and Macomb, we did. We don't do that directly, but we help connect to those resources. And actually, Community Housing Network does keep the... Um, the wait list, if you will, and collect documents for the homeless choice voucher specifically with the homeless preference. So it all is sort of inter interwoven and combined. We don't do it directly though, but we assist. And then once those polls happen, we really work with our community partners to make sure the documents are turned in so individuals can get connected to that voucher. Thank you. Commissioner Powell. Mm -hmm. If a constituent was trying to seek the status of their voucher that they had and they probably lost it due to not being able to find housing, who do they reach out to or where do they start? So a couple different ways. First of all, no one will be able to know what number, if you will, they are on a list. MISHTA won't give that information. Community Housing Network doesn't have that. But we could see why they were potentially deactivated. Maybe it was loss of contact, like you're saying. Um, and we could we could start. You could start through me. I could I could connect to MISHTA or Community Housing Network. It just sort of depends on what type of voucher they had. If it was a homeless preference voucher, then definitely Community Housing Network. Otherwise, we could connect and, and reach out to, to MISHTA to help that individual find out what happened and hopefully get that reactivated. Okay, I'll get your information from Cavell. Thank you. Okay, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. T Tim from Habitat for Humanity. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. Before you begin, Tim, we have a qu question from Commissioner Gershenson. Thank you, and thank you to all of you for coming this morning. Um, Leah, could you just give me an example? I mean, we know there is a shortage of beds. So we're putting this money into increasing the amount of beds. Give me an example of how that how that's going to work. How those funds would be utilized? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think at this point it would be a you know it would be an open RFP. This is how I envision it that you know a shelter provider that already provides shelter could expand what they're doing into additional parts of the community or expand the um, the 
facility that they already have. But we do have other shelter providers that are a warming center, for example, Welcome In, that's only open a portion of the year. So I, I'm not sure who, you know, or what entity Haven Domestic Violence might apply for these dollars. And then there would be a match for these dollars. And it, I think it just depends if it would be a new build or an addition, and we would be able to increase those shelter beds that way. I think it could be a multiple, you know, multiple different ways to to kind of work through that and add those beds. And what's the time frame on using this money? Yeah, so once this passes, the since this is ARPA funds and this is in response to the chronic need as evidenced by COVID, the idea is to push this out as soon as possible because the need has been there and it's only been exasperated. And to be honest, another cold winter in this situation for, like Leah said, the 90 folks, and mind you, I talked to Garth from Veterans Affairs before this, 14 of those are veterans. So again, having people sleeping rough for another winter. So I think that's just an informal timeline, but ASAP. Well, so the money has to be spent though by a certain... Most definitely. By, is it 2026? 2026, 2026 December 31st. Money has to be spent. Yep. So will there, is there a reporting mechanism yes. built in? In the resolution? Quarterly. Uh, hmm? I think it's said quarterly. Yeah, right? it's quarterly updates from the housing department and they'll be the ones administering this and then if these folks or other community partners subgrant to actually do the work, then they'll be able to offer insight too. Thank you. Commissioner Jackson. Okay, I just want to um, <coughs> clarify something for myself. This funding, as um, the attachment in Exhibit B um, states, is for um, the cost of building, acquisition and, acquisition and development costs. So as far as just um, piggybacking on um, uh, during COVID and congregate settings weren't appropriate, we used hotels and motels. Um, this funding could not go to those entities that still might want to house people because, you know, in, in the city of Southfield, and I know zoning may um, be an issue, but we have a lot of underused, um, smaller hotels or even larger hotels where portions are underused because of um, just business travel changing. And um, as we foresee, uh, the potential of business travel not being at the clip that it was prior to COVID. Um, could these dollars be used to continue those type of sheltering operations? Um, I can speak to that. So, okay. Janet, you must have read the Homeless Blueprint. Good call, because yes, that is actually one of the key factors and mm -hmm. thoughts in this is that maybe it's buying a building that already exists like a motel that might be underutilized. Mm -hmm. um, it might also be building a new facility just to meet the need. Or if anyone's ever gone to Hope Warming Shelter as an example, mm -hmm. um, it's in an old church which has a big, you know, there's a big open space because that's where the sanctuary was. And then there's just a bunch of bug beds in it. So there's actually foundations that have told organizations that Leah works with that say, we fund homelessness, but we can't fund organizations in Oakland County because they're just not places where we would want people to sleep because two, three level bunk beds, especially during COVID, just isn't safe. Mm -hmm. Your neighbor snores, right? And then on top of that, the risk of COVID exposure makes it even worse. So part of the building is making dividers, say, at an open space or buying a motel that's underutilized. Great point. Which, again, what Mark and Leah have been talking about the attainable trust fund and the shelter capacity fund are leveraged funds. So it's not just our dollars going in. It For Mark, what he was saying, it's like a 10x return because banks invest in this to keep their Community Reinvestment Act license. The shelter capacity fund would be a, ideally a one-to-one -one match at least. So this $7 million would become $14 million at least that the organizations would have to raise privately. And then the last thing I'll say about those two is that they're also in the homeless blueprint that we've been working on through the housing department for the last year that this committee approved back in November. All right, <clears throat> we'll move on to Tim to talk about roofs, ramps, and repair program. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, commissioners, Mark, Leah, 
Um, yes, Road Tramps and Repairs is a critical home repair program that serves uh, low to moderate, typically fixed income individuals uh, that are currently experiencing uh, substandard housing because in most cases they can't afford uh, major critical repairs on a fixed income. Uh, many of uh, the clients that have applied are seniors on fixed income where they've paid their home off and want to spend their senior years uh, in, in the home that, they, that they're accustomed to. So uh, to give an example, uh, we did receive funding a couple years ago from, or a year ago from the CARES Act. It was administered through Oakland County and United Way. Uh, it was a grant of $200,000 to launch the pilot program. Uh, we completed 18 projects uh, in a four month grant period over eight cities and municipalities in Oakland County. Um, so, uh, very successful program. As a result of that program, we have over 100 applications uh, sitting in our office uh, of people who have expressed a need for critical home repairs. We focus mainly on roofs, ramps, and other critical repairs. Uh, the program requires an assessment of the house. Uh, someone may call us thinking they need uh, their siding fixed, uh, but there might be actually a more critical condition that affects their health, uh, such as a furnace uh, that could be uh, dangerous to the household or um, plumbing or electrical conditions that uh, could be dangerous as well. Um, so there's a there's a there's an assessment that's done, and then uh, project is determined and then funded and completed. There is a uh, there is an application process. It's a simple application process, but it does determine uh, affordability. So one of the differences between this and the existing counting program is. We actually can reach a broader constituency in the low to moderate income range, so 80% AMI and below. We do require uh, that the home be owned, uh, that there's insurance on the house and other, other qualifications. Uh, but a lot of need right now, uh, and this, this program addresses our existing housing stock and more broader look at neighborhoods and how do we not only uh, create more units in the uh, attainable housing trust fund and deal with homelessness, but also how do we help uh, folks who uh, are existing homeowners in our neighborhoods. Tim, how does somebody apply for the roofs, ramps and repair program, your program currently? Uh, well, they can either call us or we have a simple application available online or it will be online when we relaunch the program. It's all based on funding availability, right? Uh, and uh, so it's typically an online application. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Commissioner Hoffman? I have a question. The last item, $100,000 for the Community and Home Improvement Division to conduct a comprehensive scan of all Oakland County community zoning policies and processes. What's that about? Yeah, thanks for asking. So the housing department, uh, when we were talking, remember being part of the study group we had a, to come up with this resolution, when we began talking with the housing department about these, which again, they're all on board with all of these projects that were explained in detail. The fourth thing they wanted to add was Shane from the housing department said he wants to uh, the $100,000 is to hire a consultant to understand the zoning rules in all 62 CVTs because one strange thing he's come across in his work is that they just don't know what Holly, Michigan's zoning rules is versus Ferndale because there isn't a unified form for that. Um, so he just wants to make sure he knows when he talks to leaders what they're expecting to get out of him and how he can work with them. Staff person, Charlie? Yeah, consultant. Like I said. 
So what is the goal? Oh, to, to know what housing zoning is like in all the communities in Oakland County, because currently we don't have an assessment of that. But what's the goal? What do we hope to accomplish by knowing what all the zonings are? I mean, all oh, communities. Well, yeah, how does home dollar? How do home dollars get administrated better? How can you do more with the community advisory council that chair, or that Commissioner Powell chairs? Um, when we're thinking about ARPA, I mean, it, it opens a whole bunch of things. I mean, it's 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 data collection to then understand what you can use your funds to support other communities with. You know, like like uh, understand the problem before you address it. But he he doesn't even know if there's a problem, so he wants to understand what it is to look into. Okay, give me an example that you would go to say Holly, Michigan. Okay. And I guess I, I'm confused on. I mean, people who want to do something in a community now go to the people that run that community and say, I'd like to build this, that, or the other thing. I'd re like to rehab this. I'd like to use this property for this. And they'll tell you what's allowed. I guess I'm not seeing spending $100,000 yeah. to go get all this data for what purpose? Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, I mean, this was something Shane wanted, um, and I believe it's part of the homeless blueprint, maybe? It's part of the housing... Oh, it's part of the housing department's five-year plan that they have to give to HUD. And I guess ask him when he shows up to the next committee meeting, because that was his big thing, you know. I would think, can I chime in? Sorry. Yeah, Possibly please. Possibly, too, because I know that's your arena of work. Um, what I would say is I would think that he's trying to be a step ahead of understanding zoning rulings throughout the communities, be it projects come before us. That's the only thing I could think of. Um, because of the different projects potentially under the three hubs of money that's coming before, I mean, just for us to internally know the rules um, on our own as far as the uh, zoning laws and things of that nature. Because, too, and I'm going to say this, we already know, um, sitting around this table, that the way for affordable housing to be done, some communities ain't even going to pick it up. So to be honest, too, I think this is to kind of let us know where the welcoming is going to be with certain projects moving forward as well. I'm just, I'm just being very frank here. Affordable no, housing is not going to go everywhere. But that is why we're trying to push to, to have this fund to still offer those opportunities, though, in these different communities as well. But we know that some of these communities are not going to allow affordable housing in them. So I still don't follow how it all connects if, and I don't know how somebody could not allow you to do something under whatever the property zone. You, you have to. The rules are the same for everybody. So no, I, I just can't see spending a hundred thousand dollars. If you have a project and you want to bring it to Holly, bring it to Holly and let's talk about it. That's why, just to correct Commissioner Paul, I don't think it's for any specific project. It's to again understand the scope of what zoning looks like throughout the county, because there isn't a unified understanding of that. So basically, what you're saying is you just ask the Holly person what you do in Holly. This up to $100,000 is to call all those people, from my understanding, to then figure out what that zoning looks like. Because also zoning ordinances are very detailed and there's a lot that goes into them. So that's what this fund is for. And if you've got more questions, talk to Shane. That's not the big thing I want to talk about. The big thing I want to talk about is attainable housing, shelter capacity, and roof ramps repair. Oh, no, I understand there's a need for a lot of this. I'm not trying yeah. to beat it up. You know, I've been sure. on the committee with you. I don't know where we come up with some of these numbers, so are we just yeah. picking numbers, or do we have a program in mind that we know is going to cost this? Well, as you remember from being in the committee, we picked very well-thought-out, data-driven numbers that then, through negotiations, got rounded. So you know okay. politics. <laughs> also, can I add, Charlie, that some communities might have restrictions on home yeah. sizes, and um, and some pro might not be interested in having a affordable housing. So, getting that information <laughs> just cleaned it up. That's would be important. And that's actually a good point. Thank you, Marcia, because or C Commissioner Gersitz, because that, that that's up, what Marcia. Commissioner Powell was saying. It this I don't believe they're not intertwined, right? It isn't 
attainable housing to then do zoning policy. It's these are the things that the housing department would like to get done, attainable housing, shelter capacity, roofs, ramps and repairs 2.0, and zoning. So they're not all interconnected. But to what Marcia's, or Commissioner Gershitz has said, that actually made me think, when talking to developers about the attainable housing trust fund concept, which by the way, several developers in Oakland County are, are uh, signed on as supporters of this concept, uh, they also said there are interesting, weird zoning things that only people like you would know because in Hazel Park, for example, you can't build a property with less than 1,250 square feet in it. But what's strange is I live in a house that's 640 square feet, and we just bought a house that's 960 square feet. Mm -hmm. So my house shouldn't even exist in the town that I want to buy in <coughs> anymore based on zoning rules. So there's all sorts of nuances to just, again, understanding to what Commissioner Powell and Commissioner Gershenson said is 1250 in Hazel Park, but it's 900 in Ferndale. They're just, you know, two communities that are squares that are between eight and 10 mile. You know, like they're so similar, but yet they have these different zoning rules. Yep. So okay, what? So you, you find a community that wants 950, wants 1250. Sure. What are you gonna do? Go to the community and say I want to build 950, even though it viols, violates your ordinance? No, you I don't know. Be able to go. A, no. Right, I know. And some communities are 2,000 square feet in certain subdivisions. Yeah. yeah. So then do that. That's fine. So it's she just wants to figure out what too. the situation is. Well, shouldn't that be up to the marketplace and the developer who wants to develop a piece of property to do his yeah, due diligence and find out what's going on? <laughs> it should. We're going to spend a hundred grand to go survey what everybody's ordinances are. Yeah, because you're not willing to do it, are you? So we got to pay someone to do it. I mean, <laughs> I'm saying it's not necessary. I think well, that's not what Shane thinks. I think Why don't you table it and discuss it when it comes in the resolution form? And I can't hear you. Oh, me? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did it. If I spoke out of turn, I, I apologize. Oh, I thought your hand was up. Oh, it was. Okay. But it, uh, um, I just think it's proactive versus reactive. I mean, why, why wait if Sean or whoever has the information ahead of time? And I think that's what is the intent of yes. this part of the resolution. And um, you being a developer, I don't, I don't know exactly your, your, um, the nuts and bolts of what you do, but. It seems like it would almost even be beneficial to you because then I'm sure this information is going to be public. Yeah. yeah. And also when Shane comes for the committee meeting about this, um, feel free to ask him. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Powell? No, I'm good. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner McGilvery. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm a little, I have a little trouble with $29 million. Uh, this is money that's available because of the pandemic. There's a lot of needs caused by the pandemic. Uh, mental health and well-being. Uh, the literacy pro program that was brought here because kids have been virtually taught for so many months. And the list goes on and on. I understand that there's a big need for housing. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I, I'm just concerned with taking $29 million uh, to address this problem when there are so many other problems that are, aren't going to get addressed because we've run out of money. May I respond, Chair? Yes. Thank you. So. Uh, one, I'll let Mark speak to that again, because he said it really well. But before he talks, uh, standard practice by NACO says you should spend a quarter of your money on housing. And Oakland County got $244 million. So we should be spending 60 to $70 million on housing. So this is a deal. Second, we have $200 million left that we haven't allocated, in the, which right speaks to the fact that this committee just approved a million dollars for mental health, wherein that means our tally towards mental health alone using ARPA money is now close to $30 million. So just to give comparison, this is less money than we've spent on mental health already. And this is to build things to help people work and live in Oakland County. And mind you, the third thing I'll say is the need that this meets is 
right? We're talking about 120% AMI, which in Oakland County means family of four making $96,000 a year or less. So this meets a lot of people's needs. And as you'll see in the resolution, we're talking about 150,000 people that are renting in subpar housing, 3,000 people that are homeless, the need for 20,000 more housing units over the next decade, even if population doesn't go up. And mind you, Oakland County is aging. So that population we're talking about isn't just low income people like the chair said that work in Oakland County but have to live in Wayne and Macomb County because they can't afford it here. It's also seniors who are on fixed incomes who are downsizing and now can't afford to live in a house in part because of property taxes. But also the fact of the matter is the things we can control is making an attainable housing unit for them to be able to live in Oakland County still. Yeah. So it's meeting the needs of several hundred thousand people would be touched by this over the next decade for $29 million. So I hear what you're saying and I totally agree. And that's actually part of why Chair and I changed the Affordable Housing Trust Fund from $40 million to $20 million, because mm -hmm. I hear you. <laughs> um, but Mark, did you have anything to add about just the good deal we're getting on this in terms of leveraging? Well, again, it, at, at a minimum, um, I would say that it's a 10 for one investment in terms of the amount of outside resources, non-government uh, investment resources that could be applied to the housing challenge that Oakland County is experiencing. And the challenge is not new. And uh, Oakland County actually has gotten shortchanged in the past because of um, uh, really not investing, uh, not being able to attract investment in housing. So we kind of um, are in the hole already. And this is really a once, as I said before, a once, and I'm not exaggerating whatsoever, it's a once in a lifetime um, opportunity to make this kind of investment. And that doesn't diminish the other, the other needs, the needs for childcare and literacy and food, and um, the list goes on and on of what the, uh, what's needed in this county. But um, the, I think that this kind of investment would produce long lasting results. It wouldn't be money just spent it would be money that would um, produce uh, an, an, a social and economic impact for decades to come. So that's why I'm advocating for strongly funding it. And the more it's funded now, the more we can leverage down the road. Thank you. Well, we can receive and file this information uh, in your packet. You see a draft resolution. So any questions you think about later, you can direct to chair. Um, so I'm going to entertain, um, my, we have a motion and a support for this informational piece. Then is that a roll call vote received? Yeah. Oh, we're going to prompt the vote. Okay. Oh, I have one, just one question for you. Mm -hmm. Charlie, can we um, add ourselves as co-sponsors to your stuff, or what, what are we doing? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mark, Leah, and Tim for joining us. A lot of good good information. Uh, Madam Thank oh. you. I hate yes. to uh, extend this. Can I ask one question? Maybe sure. Charlie can answer it, or Commissioner Cavell can answer it. Um, in the guiding principles, it talks about deconcentrating. And I just am not familiar with that term. If you Can you tell us what that term is about? Yeah, um, deconcentrating, not decongregating. Deconcentrating, isn't that what it says? OK. I did. As the number one guiding principle? Yeah, so decon... I just don't know what that term means. And I was yeah. wondering if you'd give us some explanation of that. So um, part of what we see in, actually, um, Pam, spoke to this about Beyond Basics, right? You see a concentration of poverty or lack of opportunity. And that then feeds into itself, like she talked about from a spiritual perspective of, right, having that all around you is not good spiritually. The deconcentrating is the same sort of thing, but as it relates to housing and economic opportunity. So if you concentrate a lack of opportunity or, say, um, concentrate housing choice vouchers, like, say, in Pontiac, where the residents of Pontiac find themselves outside of opportunity because they live in communities that concentrate poverty, concentrate economic disparity, they then miss out on opportunities because of that concentration. So making sure that that is a more balanced distribution. 
Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So, do we need to prompt the vote again? We have seven yeas, zero nays. All right. The information is received and filed. Thank you. Our last item is public comment. Any foot, anyone from the public wishing to address this committee? Might as well, since I'm sure. here. Yes. <laughs> I was going to leave, but it was too exciting not to stay for the whole thing. Nice. <laughs> um, I just, you know, um, Pam, who spoke earlier, that was a very interesting presentation. I had never heard anything like that before. And those numbers were pretty staggering. I know my husband had dyslexia growing up, and he had a lot of struggles learning to read. Thank goodness he had a mom who was able to tutor him because she was an early education specialist. Um, but my mom also worked in the county jail system helping to um, teach inmates how to read, too. So I, it really, what she said really resonated with me. Um, I know there's over $3 billion being pushed into the schools for COVID money. Maybe there's a way to make that part of this because obviously she said this has gotten worse since the pandemic. So, you know, just trying to think outside of the box, see how we can make it affordable with all that money coming in. Like I said, $3 billion. What did she say? It was $200 million for if we addressed all of Oakland County. Maybe start a pilot program in Commissioner Powell's district using some COVID money for that. Just trying to figure out how we can help these kids. You know, when she talked at the beginning about how it's so important that we reach out to them and if you can get them at a younger age, I think it was um, Commissioner Hoffman had that great. Um, quote from Frederick Douglass, too. So I'd love to see something proceed forward without it being a financial burden on our st our county, of course. So thank you. All right, thank you. OK, uh, there is no other business to come before this committee, so I will declare our committee adjourned at 110. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.